Okay, so today we're talking about credit cards, and we're talking about some myths that a lot of people uh, either believe or buy into or use as an excuse slash stumbling block to get them into large amounts of debt very easily and quickly. Uh, before we start, though, um, what is your general knowledge concerning credit cards? Uh, are they good? Are they bad? Are they neutral? What What have you heard? Debit cards are good. Credit cards are bad. Okay. Why are debit cards good and credit cards bad? You're using money that you already have. You're using a debit card. You're using money that you don't have to pay for credit cards. This is an excellent point. Yeah. Okay. What else? Any other good things you've heard about them? They can help you out of the bond. But then they can also make it worse. Okay. I mean, they could help you out of the bond, quote unquote. Um, they could also make it worse, also very true. Okay. Um, there are several myths on credit cards that are listed in this article here. And this is going to be a pretty quick lesson and hopefully not too boring. But we're going to talk about some myths or lies that get people or keep people in credit card debt. Um, one that's not really dealt with on this, and I wanted to go ahead and mention off the bat before I forgot about it, is a lot of people here that you need a credit card so that you can start building your credit score. Okay, you all heard that one before? Okay, let me tell you what a credit score is. Um, remember, nobody out there is ever really trying to do you a favor when it comes to things like selling you a car or you know giving you a credit card. A credit score is something that loan companies or other credit companies look at to see how willing you are to go into debt with you. Okay, the higher your score is, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got good credit. It means, hey, you borrowed a lot of money. And, I mean, you probably paid back. But it just means, hey, we can keep asking these people if they want to keep borrowing money from us, and they'll probably say yes. Okay? You are an easy mark, okay, as uh, Carnival uh, Barker's might say. So a credit score is not something you have to have. I frankly don't even know what my credit score is. Or if I've got one. And the reason is, the only money that I owe, the only money that I've owed in over 10 years, is the mortgage on my house. Um, I fairly recently had to get a credit report from one of the credit agencies. Actually, I got credit reports from all three of the credit agencies. I'm just going to show you mine from uh, Equifax here. And that's because somebody stole my identity. Um, I told you all about this, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So somebody tried to file, or somebody did file, an unemployment benefits thing. Uh, I found out about this from the business office because whoever it was used my uh, name, and they also used my social security number, which is not great because it means that my social is out in the wild right now. But let me just kind of show you some stuff on my credit report here. So. The summary of my credit report, here's when I first said, hey, I might be a fraud victim, and they put that on on like April the 12th. Um, length of my credit history here is 11 years and 8 months. The reason is because 11 years and 8 months ago, um, I opened an account with Amarillo National Bank, and that's my mortgage loan. That was back on August 21st of 2009. Um, I currently carry a principal balance with them of uh, just a touch over $20,000, meaning that that's how much I owe on my house at this point, and at this rate we're going to have to pay it off in three years. Um, now I've got a credit limit, quote unquote, of $67,000, <coughs> meaning that if I wanted to go out and get a loan right now, um, the most that it would be safe for a company to loan to me would be $67,000. Okay. That's a pretty good chunk of change. What you don't see in this picture, though, is that for the last uh, 12 years, in fact, I'll short down a little bit more if it'll let me, um, this has been my payment history for the last two years anyway. This actually has been my loan balance for the last two years anyway. Back in April of 2019, it was at 30000 It's just about at 20000 now. So we paid you know, about 10000 in our principal this last year. Uh, Scheduled payments, you can see they're around $900 each month. They're up or down just a little bit. 
from year to year because they have to kind of keep recalculating because the uh, differences in things like uh, real estate taxes and homeowners insurance and stuff like that. Um, my credit, you, you notice, has not changed at all since then. Okay. Now, let me see. Do, 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 do. Fixed rate mortgage, fixed rate mortgage. That's the comments that have been made since, like, you know, anytime anybody's been looking at stuff on the loans. Payment history going backwards. Check mark is when it's been paid on time. The reason these have all been paid on time is because we've got our mortgage set up to automatically come out of our checking account every month. So we don't have to like physically write a check or pay a bill. It just comes out. So only thing we have to do is we have to make sure that when it comes out that we've got money in the bank. And we do that by not spending. Okay, by setting aside that money each month in our mortgage is saying, hey, that's gonna go or in our budget. That's gonna go toward our mortgage so we can't spend it for anything else. Um, now, what I've been doing for the last 12 years while we've had this house, paying off these bills, um, is I've been building what's called equity. Okay, uh, We purchased our house for $87,500, and uh, like I said, we owe about $20,000 on it right now, which means that we've got about um, 60, well, that's where the $67,000 comes from. Um, In the, in the next three years, if we decide, hey, we want to sell our house after we've got it totally paid off, we can sell it, and what we've already paid into it, that like $87,000 or whatever, uh, actually beyond that, whatever we sell it for at that point, we'll be able to keep it all. You know, if we sell it for $100,000, then we'll have $100,000. Which, if we then wanted to turn around and use as a down payment on another house, uh, you know, if I needed to get a little bit of credit, it wouldn't be a hard time. I mean, a hundred and sixty thousand dollar house would give me a pretty dang nice house. Okay, nicer than anything I've probably ever lived. Um, and then, you know, of course, I'd be picking up more, you know, loans off that. Somebody asked me this morning. They said, "So it's okay to go into debt on a house?" And I said, "Yes, that is the only time when it is okay to go into debt." Because a home is probably your single biggest investment you'll ever make. And unlike a car, for instance, a home's value tends to just go up. Okay? Um, real estate, uh, property values, etc. Over time, not all of them, but for the most part, over the long term, property values do go up. Okay, so it is a good investment. And you got to live somewhere. So if you're living somewhere, you might as well, and paying for it, you might as well be getting something long term. Now, that's not going to be true for everybody. I mean, if you get into a career where you spend your entire life going from place to place, working, you know, different jobs for a company, and maybe they station you someplace for a year and some other place for a couple of years, you know, you can pretty comfortably live out of hotels or apartments. You know, nice thing about a hotel or an apartment is, hey, I don't have to pay for maintenance on the place. Um, you know, somebody else takes care of all that, so it's never my headache. No, I'm not building equity, but at the same time, heck, I'm seeing the world. I'm, I'm living the dream. I'm having a great time. You know, and any money that I am able to set aside, I can sock right into a retirement account. That way, when I finally retire from my job, you know, I can get myself and probably pay cash for a pretty nice, you know, apartment or house to live out in my days. <clears throat> or just keep living in hotels the rest of my life. You know, I think it's actually cheaper to live in hotels than it is to live in a nursing home. I don't know where I heard that. It could be total BS, but I mean, nursing homes cost a lot. They do cost a lot. That's right. Hotels are nice. <laughs> Clean towels. Um. So anyway, so a credit score is not necessarily something you need to worry about, and you do not have to have a credit card to have good credit. Um, for us, just our mortgage loan has been enough. It's not like we've never had credit cards. There have been a couple times, and they have never been a good thing, but we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. So let's talk about some lies behind credit card debt. The first one is, unlike what Braden was saying, if you have an emergency, if you are in a pinch, then having something where you can use a credit card to pay for something as an emergency thing can be a good thing. The thing is, what we think is an emergency is not always an emergency. Okay, something that we should have planned for is not an emergency. Okay, 
if we know that our car breaks down, well, cars do that. We should have been saving aside some money, either because we're saving up for a dream car or because we just know that cars break down and have problems, putting money into a long-term maintenance fund. Um, oh no, college tuition's due next month. It's an emergency. No, it's not. You've known that was coming. Okay, should have been planning for it. Okay, if it's not a threat to life or limb, it's really not an emergency. Okay. Uh, now what they say in here is, well, let's say you do have an emergency. I mean, that is legit. <coughs> you want to try and make sure, hey, you'll be able to pay it off quickly. Like we're talking within a month or two. It's much better to have emergency savings, to have that, you know, three months of emergency fund set aside from wages or living expenses so that if something happens, you don't have to pay for that. You don't make a bad thing. Uh, number two, we deserve it. That's great. Um, sometimes you're just going to look up and you will have been working like crazy without any breaks. You'll be tired. You'll be grumpy. And, you know, you're, you'll are you look over and, man, your shoes are looking shabby. And you're like, you know what? I work my butt off. I deserve a nice pair of shoes. Wait, I don't have any money in the clothing budget. Well, I don't care. I deserve it. I'm going to treat myself. I'm going to go put it on the plastic. Okay. That, that's that's self-centered. I'm sorry. That's a lie. Now, is it okay to spend money on yourself? Yeah. It's perfectly fine to spend money on yourself, but plan for that kind of thing. You know? Use it kind of as a celebration for when you reach a goal. Say, okay, when I hit such and such goal, whether it's financial, whether it's something else, I'm going to celebrate, and it's going to cost me about such and such money. Okay? And it's not the money that's going to make it special. It's the fact that it's a planned out thing. Uh, it's something to bargain. Let's say that you have been shopping for a computer. You've been really wanting a new computer for a while, and you see a thing pop up that says, hey, today only, one day sale. You can get this computer, and you can save $500 if you buy it today. Well, you look in your wallet, and there's not that much money in there, but you're like, I got this plastic here. Man, it's a really good deal. I should just go ahead and charge it right now. Two things you never want to use as motivation for spending money. One of them is fear. You never ever want to make a money-based decision or any decision out of fear. And two is time pressure. If it's on sale now, it will go on sale now. You just have to be patient. And even better, if you're pretty sure it's going to be on sale again, you start saving up money. To where when it does, hey, you got it all. That one's a hard one for me because I really do like bargains. But if I'm spending money to quote unquote save money, that doesn't make sense. Um, it's not much money. This is the thing. How many of you, you know, if I said, okay, I'm going to need you to spend $100 on something tomorrow, you'd be like, no. But if I said, okay, I'm going to need everybody to bring a dollar tomorrow for a thing, you'd be like, no. Oh, not a big deal. It's easier to spend small amounts of money. Um, and so what we do whenever we go into debt, like with credit cards, we nickel and dime ourselves into debt. Okay? Like, I want a coffee. Yeah, I'll just put it on the card. 350 Yeah, it's not much. Yeah. Um, yeah what do you like that shirt? 15 bucks. That's not that much. Sure, put it on the card. And before you know it, all those little nickels and dimes have really added up to quite a bit of credit card debt. Uh, because it's psychological. Big thing psychologically with credit cards or debit cards is that it doesn't hurt. You know, if I take a piece of plastic out, I put it in a machine, I hit a button, I take it back out, you know, I don't really get a sense that money is moving. If I reach into my wallet and I actually have to pull out bills, tens and twenties, that stings. And spending ought to sting a little bit. You ought to be aware, hey, I don't have this money anymore. Okay? I can't spend this again because I'm spending it now. Whereas it is way too easy, especially with little stuff. I think it's really interesting the saying here that at some point a few years ago there was a stimulus plan that went through for some people, and instead of like sending them a big check, they sent stuff to their employers, and their employers increased their take-home pay by seven to thirteen dollars. You know, not a big deal. But see. People are more likely to spend a little bit and truly stimulate the economy than they are to like, you know, oh, I got this $400 check. 
oh Lord, I don't want to just blow all this money. I need to save it. I need to hide it under my mattress. I need to like you know put it somewhere where it's not circulating. It's not really stimulating the economy. It's better for me, but it's not better for whatever they were writing this this law for. Um, line of five payments small. We already looked yesterday at how you know even though you can have very small minimum credit card payments, if you just pay minimum payments, then you will literally be paying for decades on the credit card. Um, I thought this was interesting here. You buy a thousand dollar TV, and you only pay twenty or thirty dollars a month for it. What you're not saying there is that the interest is so high that by the time you've got it paid off, you will have paid somewhere between three and four thousand dollars for your thousand dollar TV. Okay, and like Jesse said this morning, that sounds great. Great idea. Uh, card rewards. Now this is one in particular that somebody brought up this morning and I'm like, okay, let's talk about card rewards. Some credit card companies offer all kinds of incentives. They're like, hey, spend with us, you get frequent flyer miles that you can trade in on trips. Spend with us and you get cash back bonuses or this or that or the other. My first question is, if your credit card is such a good thing, why are you having to ride me into it by giving me presents? And the reason is because they know most people are not going to be able to pay it off quickly or stick with all those payments, and they're going to be making money. They're going to be making more money than they're losing through the rewards. Okay, it's a sure thing for them. It's not even the end. Uh, if you have a zero annual rate credit card, a zero card fee credit card, and you make it a planned part of your budget to only spend what you are 100% going to completely pay off that month and you reap some rewards from that, I can't really think of a bad thing about that except the temptation of knowing, hey, I've got this plastic in my pocket and if I really wanted to, I could go out and I could charge for it. And that's a dangerous thing. I like things that come like fire. Fire is not bad. Back when we had a big freeze you know, a month or two ago, I really liked the fact that I had some firewood left over. And we could light a fire in our fireplace when the power went out instead of one, and you know, light a fire and help our poor heater that just wasn't able to keep keep the house warm, keep the house warm. But I also know that if I had built that fire in the middle of my living room, you know, it would have burned my house down. If I had like stuck my hand in that fireplace, it would have like burned my hand. Okay, because fire can be extremely dangerous. There's definitely a very specific time and place when it can be a good thing. I think. Credit cards, if anything, are more dangerous than fire Okay. As long as you are a trained fire handler, and you have a proven track record, and you solemnly swear to never misuse this fire, then I'm going to say solid and maybe it's a good idea. Typically, it's not. Um, love this stuff, 0% APR. You know what APR is? An annual percentage rate. Okay. So like a lot of credit cards say, hey, for us, if you get this new card, then you have 12 months with zero APR, meaning for 12 months, we're not even going to charge you anything to use our credit card. But look out for month number 13, because that's going to be when they drop that 20% finance charge on you. And from then on out, anything you charge, you're paying that 20% interest on you. Yeah. Do you even need a credit card? No. No. Okay, well, it used to be that there were some situations where you kind of did. And this was back when debit cards were just getting going as a thing. I remember the last time we had a credit card was back when Reed was a baby, like we were, uh, 15 years ago. And my wife and I were going to, I had a teacher training thing down in San Antonio, and she was going to come with me and bring the baby. And we were going to have a few days while I did stuff. You know, she was going to get to kind of see the town and hang out. And, uh, we couldn't get a rental car using our debit card. The rental car companies back then wouldn't take those. Um, and then the same thing, certain airlines wouldn't go through taking on a debit card back then. So we applied for them, we got a credit card specifically for that trip to pay for the plane tickets and to pay for her. And we paid it off. I wish I could say that we didn't do anything stupid with that, and by we, I mean me. 
I did use it a few more times, and it had come back and bite us, and we lost money because the temptation was too great for me to not do so. I didn't have enough self control. <coughs> they talk about this thing called balance transfer. So if you've got like you know a balance transfer, basically this means you're in debt somewhere else, and you're getting a credit card to pay for that debt, so you can be in debt for this new credit card. Now, if they say, hey, for the first 24 months you've got zero APR on balance transfers, and you're you know in debt on something else. If you can pay that completely off with a zero APR credit card, that's not a bad thing. You can save a lot of money in interest. If you have a plan in place to completely pay that off before that zero APR is over. Okay? Because otherwise it doesn't do any good and anything to make it worse. Uh, if you own a small business, having a business credit card Sometimes can be a really good thing because it can help to keep your spending separate from your company spending, which is really good at tax time. Um, but you have to also be careful, just like with a personal credit card. You have to really say, okay, is what I'm about to spend here a necessity or is it a luxury? And then number 10, this is the big one. Let me tell you, back when I was a freshman in college, and this steams me so much now that I know what it's all about, I remember during freshman orientation, uh, there were a couple credit card companies that had come and they had set up booths out on the lawn and they were playing music and they were letting people apply for credit cards and if you came by and applied for a card, they had all kinds of goodies. They were giving you like free cups and towels and frisbees and t-shirts and other, you know, fun free stuff for college students and college students love free crap. And a whole bunch of my friends were like, yeah, dude, did you go get a Discover card? And I didn't, but a lot of my friends did. And those same friends over the next few years, if you ask them, you know, a couple of years later what they thought about Discover Card, they had nothing but four letter words to say about them. Because they then took those Discover Cards and they went out and they bought computers, they went out and they bought clothes, they, you know, bought a new speaker system for their car, bought a set of golf clubs, you know, whatever else it is that they wanted to get, and then they found out, hey, you gotta pay for those. And so by the time a lot of them were out of college, not only were they coming out with college loan debt, they were coming out with a pay happy dose of credit card debt. Um, it says on here, you know, $10,000 or more in credit card debt is not uncommon for college graduates because it says here that a lot of graduates who have credit card, they really start spending it up when they're junior and senior years because they're thinking, hey, when I get out of here, I'm gonna have this fatty, awesome, high paying job. I can just pay it all off when I'm you know, and I do have college. That's great if, if that all happens. You know, nothing certain. And that is why you do uh, internships and start looking for jobs before you graduate. That's right, you get your foot in the door, you get to meet people. Nine tenths of getting a job is who you know. And making good impressions of people, getting some good experience. Um, it's not a bad thing to have somebody put in good work for you, especially if they've seen you work. And, I mean, that's how I got my first teaching job, honestly. My wife had been teaching for about a year, and uh, the principal at that school had vowed he would never again hire another uh, husband and wife teaching team because there were a couple teachers in there before she got there that were the worst. They absolutely did not do their jobs right. They were terrible to the kids, uh, this, that, and the other. Oh, and they both graduated from the same college, my wife. So he was not about to hire another husband and wife uh, pair like that, but I met the janitor, the custodian at the school one day when I was up there visiting my wife. Talked to him for a while. He went in and talked to the principal, said, Mr. Poole, this uh, Mr. King guy, I think you need to hire him. And Mr. Gould, the principal, uh, trusted you know, Sandy Silva enough that I got a shot at his job. Yeah. So, uh, I love this, the byline, this dude right here. After amassing more than $255,000 in debt on a math degree from the University of Miami, 
this guy now enjoys spending time at home learning about personal finance. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. Um, so, credit cards, good, bad, neutral. I would say nine times out of ten or more, don't get a credit card. Even if you really think you need a credit card, you probably don't need a credit card. Okay. Definitely not when you're already young and in a vulnerable place financially. Okay. Save cash, pay cash. Debit cards, love me my debit card. But even there, you know what I was talking about, how cash should sting a little bit? Uh, there is a system of budgeting called an envelope system that is super handy. If you've got certain categories, like food, clothing, or fun stuff, and you want to make sure that you don't overspend those every month, then at the start of the month when you get your paycheck, you go ahead and take out in cash however much you're going to spend that month on food, clothes, fun stuff, whatever, and you keep them in separate envelopes. If it's time to buy food, you take the food envelope to the store, and you pay out of that. When the money's up, you don't buy no more food. Okay, same thing with fun. And fun is probably the most important one because it's really easy to spend on fun stuff. Okay, when the fun money runs out, you can make sure yourself, hey, fun money's out for this month, I'm not spending any more fun. And the question is, but wait, what if I've still got like, you know, a week to go before I get paid again and I'm out of food money? Do I just starve? No. A, I guarantee you there is food in your house. It may be like a really old packet of instant onion soup mix. It may be, you know, something else that you're like, oh, I really don't want to eat that. But I guarantee you there's going to be food there. Okay. You can get by on what's in the back of your pantry or in the back of your freezer, you know, for a week's time. Two, even if you go a day or two without food, it's not going to kill you. Water, yes, will kill you. Okay, keep drinking that water. But your body has got this amazing storehouse of extra calories socked away for just such a occasion, and so few of us have ever actually had to use it. And I've been adding to my storehouse for decades now. I've still never had the interval out there. It's not a bad thing. And if anything, you know, you'll be spending those two days hungry thinking about, hmm, next month I'm going to be smarter with how I spend my food. And maybe I'm going to take some money from my fun envelope, put it into my food envelope so this doesn't happen again. Not a terrible thing. Does anybody have any other thoughts or questions or comments or snide remarks regarding credit cards? They are hopeless. Yes. We're making somebody some money. So basically, just don't be stupid. Yeah, and it's so easy to. It really is. But you, you learn hopefully from it. You know, stupid is a really good teacher. 